Hello and welcome to the Trial On Podcast. I am your host, Bo. This is my co-host. Uh, all the guys want to be him. All the girls want to be with him. The people's host, Denny. How are you going? Yeah, mate. I'm good. How are you? Good, mate. I thought I'd give you a little pick-me-up after that one from four on the weekend. It makes me happy because the kitty keeps growing. If you're watching this video, make sure you leave a like and leave a comment. Every comment gets you in the running to win that kitty money. It stands at $40 right now. And I have said, if Denny goes eight from eight, which I don't think he is capable of doing, I will double whatever is in the kitty and we'll pay out. So let's get straight into it. What are we talking about? All righty. So we've got some pretty big news coming out of the NRL uh, the last couple of days. All the New South Wales-based teams. Uh, so the Warriors, Knights, Raiders, Dragons, Eels, Bulldogs, Sharks, Roosters, Rabbitohs, Seagulls, Panthers, and Tigers will be moving to Queensland for at least the next four weeks, they reckon, and possibly until the end of the season. Yeah. Um, so that's the 12 clubs. With the 12 clubs, they'll be split into three separate hubs in Brisbane, Sunshine Coast, and Gold Coast. Um, obviously, four clubs per hub. Um, each team will be permitted 30 players, 11 support staff in their bubble, and can only leave for training and matches after the 14 days um, of arriving in Queensland. Sorry. Uh, fans will be unlikely to uh, allowed to go to games for the first three weeks, but obviously the NRL is working to change that stance from Queensland. That's weird that they can't go to the games. But, um, yeah, Canberra is involved in that as well. So it's all the New South Wales clubs plus Canberra. Yep. Um, I think that's pretty crazy. The Storm and Cowboys will be on a fly-in, fly-out basis, so that's that's another challenge for them. But at least the Cowboys and Storm get to stay at home. I know the Storm relocated for a long time last year, so that's good for them. Yep. I think I think until late in the piece, the Canberra Raiders thought they weren't going to have to move because Canberra don't have a lot of COVID cases, if any. So I thought they were pretty unlucky to move, but yeah. I think it makes more sense just getting them all in there and get them in a bubble. I thought... Sean Johnson made a very good point here. Um, he talked about why don't they just relocate it to New Zealand, the whole competition. Mm-hmm. Now, he said, I'll read his tweet, uh, comp should relocate to NZ, play right up and down the country, players and staff in a bubble already, so no COVID. Uh, reward uh, New Zealand for their sacrifice. New Zealand would love it. My thoughts on that, uh, I think no COVID over there means every team could have their own region, you know what I mean? And then... They could really just engage in the community, do some school visits, some clinics, like try and grow the game in New Zealand. I think that would be really good. But financially, I don't think it can happen. It's already costing them around $13 million a month to move away from New South Wales. Oof. Far yeah, so it's already money. costing them a fair, a fair slog just to move the game to Queensland, let alone to New Zealand. Mm. But it's pretty interesting. What do, what do you think this means for the competition? I think um, we saw the benefits of playing out of a hub for the Storm last year. Like they were all, they were all just together the whole time on the Sunshine Coast, and then they end up winning a comp because of it. So maybe it could bring some teams together. I mean, it could be. I don't think it'll do too much difference for the Storm because obviously they're already on top. So yeah, some of these other teams maybe it it, it could could kind of change how they're going, and maybe it could do some good for the Raiders. They had a good week win on the weekend. Sorry, but yeah, I don't know. I think it'll just be mainly the same for most teams. Over under three weeks for someone to break the bubble. Under. <laughs> Surely. That's Jai Arrow. Jai Arrow sneaking in. I thought it was his missus. I thought it was his missus. But then it's a dancer, so Jesus. He's, he, it was his ex-missus because I think they broke up. So oh, they've it, broken up. No, I think they broke up before that, just before oh, that. Oh, okay. She, by the way, I told Tori this. I said if that was my missus, I'd be trying to sneak her in as well. Like she's a glamour. But Sorry, apparently they broke up. Yeah, apparently <laughs> they broke up, and um, and that's why he was. I don't know. He's seeking some comfort. Um, in that regards, as for the dragon situation, the dragons COVID situation, we all know Paul Vaughan has got the sack eight games. Mm. Um, now the NRL is trying to make them sign a stat deck to um, just assure that no one else was at the place when they were having the party. Apparently, ten of the twelve players have signed. The other two have not signed. That we don't know who the players are right now. But the thing, the thing about signing a stat deck is it's a legal document. So if you sign that and say this is what happened and you're lying, then you that's huge, huge issues there. So mm. that's pretty interesting. <laughs> we'll have to see how that develops. But the NRL has said that they will not let those players play unless they sign that stat deck. They'll have to do a two week quarantine. So oh, okay, 
Yeah. Well, it doesn't make any sense because the two players that don't sign it, they get a quarantine for two days, but uh, two weeks, sorry, but the other 10 were with them. I know, but all of them originally said they weren't going to sign and then a couple signed and some didn't. And then slowly they all started to sign. So they're at 10. I'd say by the, the time this comes out, they probably all would have signed, I would say. All right, sweet. Well, yeah, good. Nice. Anyway, anyway I am big. You know this. I'm a big fan of the Olympics. Huge fan. Mm-hmm. Love the Olympics. It starts in 11 days. I can't believe that. Ooh, 11 it's days. It's come out of nowhere. It was meant to be last year, obviously, but it got delayed due to COVID. I'm buzzing for it. Um, Australia will be taking over 472 athletes to compete over the 16 days in Tokyo. Mm. What's your favorite thing about the Olympics? Um, okay, my favorite thing, I enjoy uh, watching Australia obviously compete in sports and hopefully win. Um, but I really enjoy watching people do things that I can't do, like people yeah. lifting heavy weights, like just doing everything at like world-class level, like jumping yeah, off a, a diving board, doing 360s, backflips and all that stuff. Um, another thing I really like about watching the Olympics is you could be watching history. Like you never know. Yeah, someone sure. could someone could break a world record or something like that. And, and the celebrations that come after when someone wins a gold medal, you know, it's really good. I, I enjoy watching people, like the emotions. Yeah. Emotions people go through when they win gold or, or just any medal, really. I was thinking, I love the stories. You know what I mean? I think it's the purest form of sport, the Olympics, because all the, we see it once every four years, right? But that that's like a lifetime journey to get to that moment, mm-hmm. that one moment where you train your whole life to win that one medal. You know what I mean? And that's what I love. It's very pure. Like we always hear, even in the NRL, you talk about who's the fastest in the NRL. Who's the fastest? You never know. But at the Olympics, you do know. Yeah. There's that one race, you know what I mean? And whoever wins that race is the fastest person in the world. Whoever, like in archery, whoever hits the bullseye the most, he's the best archer in the world. You know what I mean? That's that's what I love about it. It's very pure. Um, in this Olympics, we are setting some records here for Australia. It'd be the highest percentage of female athletes to ever uh, compete at 53%. Uh, highest number of Indigenous athletes at 16 athletes. We'll have our oldest ever Australian competitor, Mary Henna. She's in the equestrian. And another equestrian, Yeah, his name is Andrew Hoy. He's competing in, in his eighth Olympic Games. So and he's an Aussie. 80, he's an Aussie. And he completed, he competed in the 84, 88, 92, 96, the 2000 the 2004, 2012, and now the 2021 Olympic Games, which is just It's a long time. Crazy. That's a lot of Olympics. Yeah, I know. That's just unbelievable. So I will be covering the Olympics because I'm just a fiend for it. I'll probably watch most of it anyway, but 11 days. So get ready for some of that. That's less than two weeks. That's, that's crazy. That's coming so quickly. This year's yeah, going so, so quick. I know. It's, well, it's not this Friday. It's next Friday. It starts and then it goes for 16 days and I love it, especially the swimming. I love the swimming. A oh, couple of new day. events this couple of new events this year too. Karate, skateboarding, sports climbing and surfing. Karate? You any good at karate? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't say so. You've done a little bit of mixed martial arts, haven't you? It's sparring? Oh, no, 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 no. That was just like a fitness fitness thing. You jumped in and sparred though, didn't you? Yeah, I sparred a chicken and she fucked it. Oops, she uh, <laughs> she belted you. Yeah, didn't she? yeah, she got me. Well, I did want to punch her because I was like, "This is my first time sparring," and she's like, "No, nah. she's like, no, oh, nah, hit me." I was like, oh. "So you did?" Knocked her out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah. All right, let's get into the game. All righty, so righty, got the first game. The Raiders actually defeat Manly thirty points to sixteen. Didn't see this one coming. Uh, credit to the Raiders, though. I mean, they they played they played all right. I thought uh, Dylan Walker is not. He's not a halfback. I don't think he should have played seven. Um, I think they really miss um, Cherry Evans' kicking game in this one. I think, uh, yeah, his kicking game was ordinary. Um, yeah. Come out of nowhere for me. Uh, Manly had to make like over 100 more tackles or something some, something near there. Uh, there was a moment late in the game where they were coming to get him and that simply broke through the line and <laughs> threw the dummy. And mm. I thought that was game over when he threw the dummy. And then I think he yeah. lost the ball. He got injured as well, so... I think if they score there, it's a two-point game and they're coming home with a wet sail and then the Raiders go home, uh, go down the other end and score and win. So 
good on the Raiders. Good win. Hopefully they can rack up a couple more of them. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Right here, we've got the Bunnies defeating the Cowboys. Hmm. All right, I tipped the Cowboys in this one. And they were on top until Scott Drinkwater decides to run crossfield and throw the ball to no one. And then, what, they get pinned in their own corner and then Kyle Felt comes and knocks it on. And I think that's that's when the momentum kind of switched up. The Bunnies, after that, just got in a roll, scored 44 unanswered points. Yeah. Mate, I've got it written here, right? This is where I think the game... I know I rang you the next day and I said I wanted numbers about this. Cowboys leading 12-6, 30 minutes in. Tamalolo then goes off the field. Yeah. By the time they get Tamalolo back on the field, the score is 30-12. to 12. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so he sat on the bench and watched, what, 24 unanswered points. Like, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know what you do there. I know we got other issues, and you just highlighted some of them there, and defensively we have deficiencies, but to have our best player off the field for 24 straight points, that's game over. When, who's turning the tide there at 30 to 12? No one. Mm. Mm. And you so. saw what you saw what, what Tamalolo did when he was on the field. He just ran straight th- straight up the middle. Yep. Just put on like a little little jig, went th- right through the middle, and they set up that that um that try. But there was also a controversial call in this one, or n- no call. Yeah. So the, the sin bin. Yeah. So Dearden, no, the non non sin bin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dearden gets yeah, I know gets yeah. hit high Liam and Knight. and late by Liam Knight. Uh, doesn't get called at all. Not even a penalty. Play on, and then a, f- a few minutes later, however long later, um, the Cowboys. Get done for a high shot, ten in the bin. So, Just no consistency yeah. there. Like I, I don't think either is either of them are a simbin. I think the lot night one should have been a minimum a penalty. Yeah, but it is what it is. I think the Cowboys. It's not the reason they lost the game. Forty six eighteen, and the Rabbitohs were. It looked like a training run for parts of that game there. Mm. So Cowboys have got some work to do, but you got to keep your best players on the field. Yeah, have to. Yeah, for sure. But I think there's a lot wrong with with the Cowboys' edge defenses. I'm not too sure oh. what. Well, uh, there was one try where where Kyle felt was past the ball, and then Scott Drinkwater was behind the ball, and you could just see they had no idea. There was three of them, and they were all in different spots when the ball was put down. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that that kind of sums up where they're where they're at. I think. Mm. Anyway. All right. So enough about uh, enough about that game. We got the Roosters. No, it, it kills me. It yeah. kills me. You know, I was at work and I was walking upstairs to go for a break and the guy walked past. He said, "What? Wow, the Cowboys are up. When I got to the top of the staircase, the Rabbitohs were going over. <laughs> so I watched, I just watched their run of points pretty much. Mate, well, welcome to my life 10 years ago. This is my yeah. life. Anyway, uh, the Roosters defeat the Bulldogs 22 points to 16. Close game. Uh, I thought the Bulldogs played well in this one. Um, there was a... Obviously, a, f- a, f- a few calls didn't go their way, and I think it's down to discipline. I think they can, yep. like the effort is obviously there. They've showed that in previous games, but I think just they got to fix up their discipline. They gave up, I don't know, what was it? A lot of sixty end. So the sixty end count was ten five. So that- do you think they can play much better than this though, the Bulldogs? Do you think they this is their ceiling? This game? I don't think this is their ceiling. No. no. Okay. I think there's, yeah, look, just work on your discipline. and I mean, they might have won that game. Well, they, I think they're going to get fined because they ran out with a different with a different team to what they had named, so they'll cop a fine there. Hmm. Uh, Lachlan Lewis came, came in late for Flanagan, and he had a bit of a game. He scored a double. Yeah. Good chip and chase try there. Um, when Nick Meany scored just after half time, it was 16 all. It was. You're in real danger of going 0-4, mate. Oh, mate. Oh, oh. I would have, I would have been very upset, you know, just sad, not really angry, just disappointed. Just disappointed. <laughs> yeah. What'd you make of um, Sam Walker running down the clock? I know he's got a lot of hate for that. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't think it was in the spirit of the game, to be honest. Yeah. I didn't have a, I didn't have a massive problem with it. We've seen him do it twice now. He done it against the Titans as well. Mm. Uh, not as blatant as what he did in this one. Um. Yeah, I didn't have a massive problem with it. I don't think he deserves all the hate he can. But I think it kind of sums up where the Roosters are at. 
like the Roosters of old kind of just kick the ball and back their defense, like back mm-hmm. themselves to defend that last minute out. Yeah. But maybe they're not as confident in themselves right now. That's that's. I think it was more of where the team's at rather than what Sam Walker was doing. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'd be down on confidence too if I, my team just got flogged by forty-four nil or whatever. Last well, week. I can remember, and this they didn't even win the comp this year, but in twenty fifteen they played the Cowboys in round one, right? And the Cowboys were smashing their line. I think they end up smashing the Cowboys, but we were right on their trial on, and they got a dud call, and the Cowboys got a repeat set. And I heard over the mic Mitchell Pierce say. Don't worry, guys. We're we're fine. We'll defend another set. We'll defend another set. And I thought in my head straight away, well, the Cowboys aren't going to go over. They're they're just too confident in what they're doing. You know what I mean? And yeah. maybe that's not where they're at right now. Which I it takes a lot of confidence out. I've I've had it happen to me in a game where we've gotten multiple repeat sets. This was at Wong. We got multiple repeat sets, and when I was playing second grade, and I could hear them talking behind the lines saying, don't worry, guys, we, we got this, we got this. And it takes pressure out of us, you know what I mean? Because we're not troubling them. We're forcing repeat sets, but we're not troubling them. Yeah. And I think I think when you hear the defense say, no, yeah. we're sweet, we're sweet, then it takes a little bit of confidence out of you. And I just think maybe the Roosters don't have that in this moment. That's a fair point. Uh, I, I was going to say they're probably down on, on confidence earlier. But, yeah, I think you're, yeah. I think you're spot on there. All right, Warriors, Sharkies. The Sharks defeat the Warriors twenty to twelve. I th- I think it's got to be so hard to be a Warriors fan. I thought they were s- they were just made it so hard on themselves. I thought they were all over them early, but every time they got in a position to, I don't know, put the pressure on and maybe stamp their foot down, they would give away a penalty oh, or yeah. they'd give away a set restart yeah. or they'd lose the ball. And there was one moment in particular in that first half where. I, I don't know who put the kick in the in goal, but they were going to force a repeat because um, the Sharkies uh, bobbled it. But then Bailey Sirenin goes for the miracle kind of put down instead. Oh. Gives away a seven tackle set. So it goes from a dropout to a seven tackle set. Mm. And they just made it so hard on himself. Adam Fanua Blake and Matt Lodge seems like a, a match made in heaven, but they gave away five penalties between them. Yeah, no, that's never good. Um, yeah, the first half. Yeah first, yeah, first half, 20 points to six in, in favour of the Sharkies. And, yeah, I was going to say, that's down to a – well, some of it is down to a 7-2 penalty count. As, yeah. you, as you said, like they were putting they, – when they were in the position to build pressure, they just give away a penalty. So, uh, it's a coach. Yeah, I thought the same thing. And then I thought Sean Johnson was really good in the second half, kicked him to death. I think it was 4-0, four, four dropouts. And then they just couldn't they, – they were just zapped after that. I think, again, they made an extra 100 tackles. I think there was a period before halftime, about 10 minutes, where the Sharks were camped on their line. So it was always going to be a long way back from there. I thought Reese Walsh was a bit uh, patchy in this one. I thought he tried hard, but um, just some things – like he almost forced it a bit. Mm. But he's it, it's his rookie season, so yeah. you're going to get that. He's only young. He's what? He's 19 now. He's not yeah. 18 anymore. He's just had a birthday. Happy birthday, Reese. <laughs> They they got um they got Dallin Watenny Zelezniak lacking a little bit on that edge. I mean they were attacking the line and Walsh went for the cutout ball and Zelezniak was twenty meters behind him. So I don't know they got to fix all that. But I I just I was watching it thinking that it's not even my team and they'll frustrate me the Warriors. Well they're half our team now. They're Central Coast based. Central Coast. Well they were Central Coast based. Oh, okay, now yeah. they're Central Queensland based. Yeah. Well, well no not until Wednesday. Wednesday. American so, uh, Wednesday. That's for two more days, there's the Central Coast Warriors. Yeah, for two more days. So what are, what are they now? The New Zealand Central Coast um, South East Queensland Warriors? Uh, yeah. Well, they're, they're worldwide. They're worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to check out our socials for any uh, breaking news and any silly videos. Um, and also, we'll be back on Wednesday for our State of Origin preview. I've taken the day off work. I've cleared the calendar. It'll be all State of Origin. The Maroons cannot lose 3-0. They can't afford it. Three games in Queensland. They are. can't lose 3-0. They will. They can and will. They won't. They will. They're not losing 3-0. They are. It'll be 2-1. It'll be a Maroons carve up on Wednesday three night. 3-0. I'm going to predict the score uh, 38-0. <laughs> it's going to be ambush season, baby. Kalen Pong and a score hat trick. Game over. Goodbye.